This week, Matt Damon is a smooth imposter known as the talented Mr. Ripley. Denzel Washington plays jailed boxing champ Reuben Carter in The Hurricane. And Al Pacino and Cameron Diaz battle over a pro football team in any given Sunday. Dickie Greenleaf? Who's that? It's Tom. Tom Ripley. Tom Ripley? We were at Princeton together. Okay. Did we know each other? Matt Damon is an imposter sent to bring rich playboy Jude Law back from Europe in The Talented Mr. Ripley, one of five big holiday movies we'll review this week. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Harry Knowles of Ain't It Cool News. It's nice to be back on the show. Nice to have you back, Harry. Okay, first movie, The Talented Mr. Ripley. This was the first in a series of novels written by Patricia Highsmith about a charming fraud who specialized in stealing not only the wealth of his victims, but their names, identities, and sometimes their very lives. Matt Damon stars as Ripley in the film, and we see him inventing his criminal career before our very eyes. One of the most effective weapons of the imposter is to tell you exactly what he's doing. Everybody should have one talent. What's yours? Forging signatures, uh, telling lies, impersonating practically anybody. That's three. Nobody should have more than one talent. Ripley becomes part of a circle including Dickie the Rich Kid, played by Jude Law, his girlfriend Marge, played by Gwyneth Paltrow, and their friend Freddie, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman. Now, I want this job of yours, Tommy. I was just saying, you live in Italy, you uh, stay at Dickie's house, you eat Dickie's food, wear his clothes, and his father picks up the tab. <laughs> uh, if you get bored, you let me know, because I'll do it. Before long, their play takes a nasty turn, and Ripley has killed his new friend. He turns into a gifted liar, concealing the crime by inventing a story to explain Dickie's absence. Is that what he said? He, he wants to be alone? He was thinking of you. He asked me to deliver this. Thank you. <laughs> He knows I love this. Ripley assumes the dead man's identity, which works until Freddy turns up. Freddy knows Dickie is missing and suspects something. You know, in fact, the only thing that looks like Dickie is you. Hardly. Hmm. Have you done something to your hair? Ripley is a fascinating character. He what? seems to have no real life of his own, and so he steals the existence and identity of others. Matt Damon's performance is scary in the way that Ripley doesn't seem personally affected by any of the suffering that he causes. He's just kind of above it. Anthony Minghella, who made The English Patient, is directed as sly and intelligent a thriller as I've seen this year. Absolutely. You know, the, the key point in this film from Matt Damon is where he says, I'd rather be a fake somebody than a real nobody. Because, I mean, that's the point where he's saying, you know, I am a nobody. Mm -hmm. And that as a single person, he can only be a nobody. Mm -hmm. It's only when he takes on other people's personas mm -hmm. that he is someone. And that's a really scary, sort of dangerous character to be getting into. And of course, Ripley was then developed in a whole group of books by Patricia Highsmith mm -hmm. as this person who kind of sidles into people's lives and steals everything they have and everything they are. And what's interesting in this movie is in most thrillers we identify with the good guy, but here we're forced to see everything through Ripley's eyes, mm -hmm. and when it seems like he must be exposed, you know, all these people who know who the real Ripley is and who the real Dickie is are going to get together in one room and realize they're not the same person. We, that has to happen, and he thinks so fast and improvises so desperately, trying to keep his whole deception in the air, and it's just fascinating. Well, that's what I love about this, is, is it's a picture-perfect pathological liar, because what you're looking at is somebody who doesn't know what he's going to say from moment to moment. He doesn't know he's going to kill somebody. He's reacting to decisions, mm -hmm. to where the roads split, and he always makes the decision that best suits him. It doesn't matter to what it means to anybody else, and he has no feelings about that. And it really involves us every yeah. single moment. Absolutely. Right. 
Okay, our next movie. In 1940, Walt Disney gave life to Fantasia. The goal was to bring classical music to the masses and to advance the art of animation. The film would be in constant flux, substituting new segments every year or so. However, Fantasia did not succeed, and Disney's dream was put on hold till now. Fantasia 2000 introduces seven new musical movements while keeping only this classic number from the original release, The Sorcerer's Apprentice. The film is bigger than ever being presented in the IMAX format. And Donald Duck is also in on the fun as Noah's assistant. Pomp and circumstance is the musical theme here. The Disney artists are quite bold in their choice of imagery, like this surrealistic whale sequence to the tune of The Pines of Rome. And this impressionistic number set to Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 5. Here, Al Hirschfeld's unique drawing style is brilliantly mixed with the magical Gershwin tune, Rhapsody in Blue. The beauty and grandeur of the presentation makes Fantasia 2000 a must-see for film fans the world over. I have only one small critique, and that is the annoying celebrity breaks with stars such as Steve Martin and Bette Midler introducing the segments. Originally, Walt Disney had Fantasia concert programs that the audience would receive upon entry to the theater. That was more in keeping with a concert film. However, this complaint is a mere trifle. Fantasia 2000 is pure art deserving not only my thumb way up, but multiple viewings as well. Gee, I enjoyed it too, and you know, I love almost anything in IMAX because mm -hmm. I like the way that the picture, as well as the sound, surrounds me. And so I really got into this and enjoyed it. Now, I know that some purists say that when you link images with music, you're locking it down when actually music should be amorphous. But on the other hand, this use of animation, this use of visual imagination to link with this music, to me is exhilarating. And I liked it, although I agree with you, we don't need the sugarcoating of the little introductions. It's like they're afraid that you won't want to hear classical music unless Steve Martin tells you it's okay. Well, it, to me it felt like they were trying to, you know, oh, excuse the lack of dialogue in our film. Here's somebody who, to, you know, keep you interested in uh -huh. what we're doing. And they didn't trust the art form because that, I mean, the animators here, the work that Disney's people did, mm -hmm. are ju it's just stunning. I mean, when, when I sat there and watched the Al Hirschfeld sequence in particular, mm -hmm. it's the most amazing depiction of New York I think I have ever seen because it's just it's, it's a constant movement and it's all about the line work there mm -hmm. it's 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 really amazing okay coming up later Denzel Washington in the true life story the hurricane I think I killed those people son no no I know you didn't and coming up next Oliver Stone's expose of pro football as Al Pacino stars in any given Sunday I'm sick and tired of this, are you? Yeah. Because if you're not, raise your hand. Come on. If you're going to act like a loser, raise your hand. What the hell are you doing, Jay? I didn't want you to be the only person with his hand raised, Cole. <laughs> Al Pacino tries to talk his discouraged team back to life in that halftime scene from any given Sunday, Oliver Stone's new movie about professional football. Pacino was a veteran coach in a desperate bid for the playoffs and under pressure after two star quarterbacks are injured and he has to rely on an unproved third string hot dog who may not even really know the playbook. I'm telling you right now, I don't know what he's doing. I didn't call that play. Pinpoint passing by Beeman means points for the Sharks. Jamie Foxx plays Willie Beeman in a dazzling performance that takes the character on an emotional roller coaster. And LL Cool J plays a team member who complains the new quarterback is threatening his own chance of a year-end bonus. The guy comes in, he's dissing this play, he's dissing that play, I got a better play. Hey, 
guys, we won. You know, what's the point here? The point is I'm trying to get paid. That's the point. No, but the point is if we don't win, you're not going to be able to do your chip and dip commercials, okay? Uh -huh. oh, what do you know? You're an offensive coordinator. The coach decides to start his veteran in the playoffs, and that gets him into a shouting match with the team owner, Cameron Diaz, who inherited the job when her dad died. You will start Willie on Sunday, and you will make the adjustment to modern times. You don't tell me what to do. On Nobody Sunday. tells me what to do. Your father never told me what to do. I'll tell you You're this. not going to stop, young lady. The dramatic scenes in the movie are very good. Unfortunately, the football footage is shapeless and confusing. It's a long movie, but the characters and their stories still seem shortchanged by the razzle-dazzle visual overkill. Less football and more comprehensible football, plus more dialogue, and any given Sunday would have been a better football movie. So I'm just giving it a marginal thumbs up. I am also giving it a marginal thumbs up, although, you know, I couldn't help but think during this movie, uh, especially during the football scenes, that Oliver Stone was directing this film. I mean, when uh, the sound would go down, you'd start hearing an Indian shaman chant mm -hmm. while the players were playing. It was like, this is Oliver Stone, you can feel him here, you know. I, I think the plot of the film, the, the arc of the story, just didn't really do all that much for me. But as a Smash Mouth football film, it, it reminded me of like the old Chewy Hart Chinese ghost story films. It's not real football, right? But then nothing in film is real. This is sort of like Oliver Stone's fantasy world where football is this extravagant, gigantic mess of people hurling bodies every which way. Well, that's all you see, though. You don't mm -hmm. get any idea of the strategy of the oh, game. No. I agree that Oliver Stone is a great director. Yeah. I think one of his problems here is that all sports movies have the same arc. Yeah. He's kind of doomed there to follow a genre that has been set in stone for, for ages. But I was sort of expecting from Oliver to maybe break that a little bit, you know, mm. and he didn't really break too much from here. Nope. Coming up later in the show, Tim Allen and Sigourney Weaver star in the sci-fi parody Galaxy Quest. The whole thing was just a misunderstanding. Coming up next, ripped from the newspaper headlines, the story of the hurricane. He put me in prison. Love's gonna bust me out. That's Denzel Washington as Reuben Hurricane Carter in director Norman Jewison's The Hurricane the true life story of a middleweight boxing champion who was wrongfully imprisoned for over 20 years. The story is told through the eyes of a young boy played by Vicella Shannon, who began reading the Hurricane's plight in Carter's autobiographical book, The 16th Round, and was moved to do something about it. Two juries found him guilty, Les. The two white juries. Hey, hey, not all white people are racists. And not all black people are murderers. The boy visits Carter in prison, and a friendship is born. Got a lot of guts, kid. Takes a lot of courage to come all the way down here by yourself. If I'm impressed, I'm oh, scared you weren't gonna let me come. Mm -hmm. Me too. But out of that friendship comes pain for Hurricane oh, Carter. Okay. This is, in many ways, the saddest letter I've ever had to write. I appreciate your many efforts and kindnesses but I am a prisoner. The number is 45472, and my job, the key to my, my survival... My number is 45472, and my job, the key to my survival, lies in my ability to do the time. Denzel Washington's performance is really something to watch in this movie. It's powerful and enigmatic, and the story of the hurricane is quite emotional. My favorite film of this type is Alfred Hitchcock's The Wrong Man. Here we have a little bit more conventional film including the bad guy cops that framed him, the good Samaritans that freed him, the trial, and so on. What interests me most about the hurricane is how Hurricane Carter survives his prison time. Overall, the film is solid. I just wish Jewison had focused even more on that struggle. Still, the movie is more than strong enough to garner a very enthusiastic thumbs up from me. Very big thumb up for me, too. And you know, I think Denzel Washington is at the top of his form here. This is as good as his work in Malcolm X, and it deserves an Academy nomination. And what got me, because at the beginning, it was kind of familiar. You know, uh, the evil cop uh, is framing this guy that he hates, and the guy goes to prison, and he doesn't belong there. And we've, unfortunately, we've seen stories like that before. But then, when the young boy comes in, and he reads this story, and he gets involved, and his foster family gets involved, and then the young boy and the older man become friends, suddenly, the movie took a big emotional U-turn, and it blindsided me. And I found by the end, there were tears in my eyes. I really got involved 
in the last two-thirds of this movie. It's strong. Yeah, that last two-thirds are amazing. Mm -hmm. the, the problem, the only problem with this film is when they cast the bad guy, they cast Dan Hedaya, who just, you know, God bless him, he looks like the bad guy. And I hate it when they do that in a movie, right? You know, I would prefer to have someone who I could believe judges and all these other people would side with against, well, you know. But, hurricane. you know, his role is kind of perfunctory anyway. Yeah. He comes in no. as the guy who it's, sets up Hurricane, and then he goes away, and the real story is about what happens next. Right. And that's a very small problem. When we come back, Galaxy Quest goes where no man, except for possibly the crew of Star Trek, has gone before. Galaxy Quest is our next movie, and Galaxy Quest is also the title of a fictional space opera that played on TV 20 years ago. Now its stars travel to fan conventions, making a living from personal appearances. But then, real aliens intercept their TV shows, think they're actual historical documents, and kidnap the cast taking them into space because they believe in their skills and need them to fight enemy invaders. The aliens have helpfully designed a real spaceship that looks and works just like the one they saw on TV. Right. Take her out. That's Daryl Weber as one of the cast members. Tim Allen, Sigourney Weaver, and Tony Shalhoub also play actors mistaken for space heroes. They based it on your hand movement. Am I the only one who saw that thing and say that? No, no, no. I'm not the guy. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Tech Sergeant Chad. I'm afraid Quan. I'm not even, Quan's not even my real name. I mean, Fred's no good, Jason. You're just going to have to kill it. Kill it? So I'm open to any suggestions. Go for the eyes like in episode 22. It doesn't have any eyes, Tommy. What do you do in an emergency? Well, you try to remember your dialogue from old shows. Go faster, Tommy! I'm going to fast! I'm behind you! Uh, press turbo! I've always seen press the turbo, right? Oh, right here! Right here! Well, press it hold it down! Alan Rickman is very good as a cast member who's fed up most of the time, and especially now. We've got to stop! We stop and we die. Tommy, just hold that thing down. Yeah, hold the turbo down. It's a quick move. Oh, like you know. Galaxy Quest has fun with two levels of special effects. First, you have the special effects on the spaceship, which are cheesy, because, of course, it's modeled after a cheesy TV show from the 70s. Then you have the enemy aliens themselves, who look great, and have been designed by the Stan Winston studio. And somewhere in between are the friendly aliens who assume the look of humans but tend to grow tentacles during sex. Galaxy Quest is goofy and funny, especially when the actors revive old showbiz feuds right there in the middle of this real space adventure. And the Earth scenes reminded me of Trekkies, the documentary about Star Trek fanatics. So thumbs up for me. Uh, this, this movie is a lot of fun. It gets a thumbs up for me as well. Uh, particularly what I like is all the characters, all the actors that get taken into the Galaxy Quest space world, they all still believe they have to play the same characters they were playing on Earth. <laughs> Never it, occurs to them they don't. No, right. No. You know, it, it's not all of a sudden like, uh, wait, I can be leader here, right? You know, it's like, I'm tired of him taking it over. You know, and what I especially like was Sam Rockwell, who in the original television series had played a character who just died in the first five minutes, and he's paranoid the entire film that... He's going to die because that's what his character is supposed to be, and he doesn't distinguish between fantasy and reality. And meanwhile, you have Sigourney Weaver repeating everything the computer says because that's what she did on the show. And so even while they're facing life and death situations here, you're right, you're right, she's still in character. Absolutely. We'll be back in a moment. Toy Story 2 is the most fun you'll have at the movies this year. Get ready for never-before-seen Toy Story 2 Outtakes. It's now funnier than ever. It'll help here, please. Toy Story 2 Outtakes now playing in theaters. Rated G. Jump. No! Out the window. Critics are calling Bicentennial Man a wonderful holiday movie. Robin Williams is brilliant. Do you have any friends? Only will fit. That is the extent of his skills. Bicentennial Man, a Chris Columbus film rated PG now playing.
Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this week's show. Two thumbs up for the sly and intelligent thriller, The Talented Mr. Ripley, starring the talented Matt Damon. Two more thumbs up for Disney's animated Fantasia 2000, which will appear on IMAX screens beginning January 1st. And two more thumbs up for Oliver Stone's Any Given Sunday, although Harry liked the game footage more than I did. Two big thumbs up for Norman Jewison's The Hurricane, with an Oscar-caliber performance by Denzel Washington. It opens next week. And finally, two thumbs up for the Star Trek spoof, Galaxy Quest. So a strong ending to a great season. The last four months have been filled with good movies. And who would have guessed that Galaxy Quest would have actually been as much fun as it was? Yeah, I was surprised. Remember, you can hear our reviews on the web at ebert-movies.com, both Harry and myself. It's part of Go Network. And my new book, Roger Ebert's Movie Yearbook 2000, is now in stores. Next week, Janet Maslin of the New York Times joins me to pick the top ten movies of the year. It's my livelihood, do you understand? It's my head, Schwartz. It's my head. Smile. You're at Mr. Smiley's. You are so busted. The best films of 1999 is next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.